conservation conservation district. Okay, yeah, continue. Okay, um, and she'll talk to us about water into the Chesapeake Bay. She is coming to us with a bachelor's from Hartwick where we met. Um, she did it in three years and then went on to Binghamton to get her master's and did her research in trace metals in landfills and mobilizing of those trace metals um, through the leachate and is now uh, at Tioga County Soil and Water and has been there for five years. So she's gonna tell us all about the work that she's doing and um, we're very excited to have her here today. All right. Here you go. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Should I put this? You want me on your, yeah. Okay. And then just share your screen. All right, well, thank you. Thank you guys for having me here today. So um, I'm Danielle Singer. I work for Tioga County Soil and Water Conservation District. So um, here's a little bit of an outline to give you a roadmap of where I'm going with my talk today. So I'm gonna start out with the big picture, what the watershed is that I'm gonna focus on, uh, which is the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which you guys are currently sitting in right now. Um, then I'm going to chat about the stakeholders and who all of those um, people are in the watershed. And then I'll get into um, the EPA's TMDL for the Chesapeake Bay, which is kind of the bulk of my talk and what that TMDL is, what that means, and what those implications are. Um, and then I will show you guys some of our project work um, that we're doing to combat the TMDL. Um, and then I'll kind of round it out with what's coming in the future. <clears throat> so here's the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So it starts all the way up here in New York and that water um, from here goes into the Shemung River. So you guys are that little red arrow, I have it pointed. So you're right on the edge of the, of the watershed. And your water goes into the Shemung River, meets up with the Susquehanna River um, near where I'm from. Um, Tioga County, um, and then head south through Pennsylvania and Maryland, and then enters the bay. Oh, so there's um, the watershed extends over six states. So there's Delaware, Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia, um, as well as the um, Washington, D.C. Um, that's part of this watershed. And so those are some of those stakeholders I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we are the headwaters of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, our area is called the Upper Susquehanna Watershed. Um, there's 19 counties in New York and you'll see that that blue area there, um, that's the actual watershed. So a watershed, right? Like the highest point of that, you know, hillside, all the water going this way is part of that watershed. And so some of our water actually comes north out of Pennsylvania. So um, like Broome, Tioga, Shemung, and Steuben County get a little bit of their watershed from Pennsylvania. So um, they share a little bit of our part of the watershed, which will be important later. Um, so what is the TMDL? That stands for total maximum daily load. And we're talking about loads of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. Um, the background to the TMDL, how it came about, um, the Clean Water Act uh, tells jurisdictions, which in this case are the states and Washington, DC, that they need to be evaluating every couple of years all their water bodies for what we call impairment. And that means that the water is not healthy. The levels of those nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment are over what they should be. And so when a water body is called impaired, it needs to have a TMDL uh, created for it, which is a pollution diet. 
So um, that's identifying the maximum amount of those three pollutants um, that the waterway can receive and still meet the standards that EPA puts out. So the, the base TMDL is actually really interesting compared to other ones across the US because it's actually 92 smaller TMDLs uh, put together to one um, that goes across six states. So it's like one of the largest um, TMDLs in the US and um, it has a lot of partners, um, which is why things can take forever to get done. Um, there's just a lot of ground to cover and a lot of people involved in it. So um, here's just another map showing you um, some of those landmarks. Um, you can see those, those areas that are red or where there's more cities, like more population of people. Um, so we, we have a lot of different um, land types across our watershed. Um, obviously, we're not as urban as when you get south into Maryland and uh, Virginia, but we do have a little bit of that. And then um, we also have a lot of agriculture in our watershed, which will also be important later. So each jurisdiction has to develop a Chesapeake Bay watershed implementation plan, which I will just call a WIP from now on for short. Um, we're in the finale of the Chesapeake Bay TMDL because that ends in 2025. Um, that's kind of the due date. And so we're, at, we're in the phase three. Um, next slide, I've got kind of the years laid out just so you can kind of see the history of what's been going on. Um, so this started way back in 2000 when they realized that the bay was unhealthy and that we needed to do something about that. Um, and so you can see as you look through these years that it's taken quite a while for them to actually figure out what they're going to do. Um, there was a first agreement in 2010 and then they redid everything in 2014 and that's the current agreement that we're working under now. Um, 2017 was the midpoint assessment from that 2014 agreement. And so we took a look at where we were. It became obvious that we were not going to meet the goals um, that they had laid out, which were very hefty goals. And I'll get into more details about the numbers in a few minutes, but um, it's a long way to go. I think we're making progress, so it's not a completely sad story, but um, they were really big goals that EPA put out for us um, and just kind of mandated that they had to get done. Um, and so now we're into the phase three WIP and those had to get submitted to the EPA in 2020. And um, if you've read anything about the Bay, you might have seen some articles coming out lately about Pennsylvania and how they're not holding up their end of these whips. They're not um, making the progress that they're supposed to. They're kind of in last place if you're gonna rank the states. Um, and New York got a little bit of um, flack for how we wrote our phase three whip as well, because we tried to be realistic and um, we looked at funding, we looked at the current state of agriculture, we looked at all of these factors that influence how we get our work done. And we tried to be realistic and say, these are the real goals we can get to by 2025. And they didn't love that, but they did, they did accept it. Uh, so now I'll get into the stakeholders. And then, um, so we're sort of building a puzzle here. And I think as I go through these pieces, it will start making more sense like, where my work at the district comes into the, um, the Bay watershed. So first is EPA, which is a federal organization. So they're at the top level headquarters in DC and they've got you know region offices. So we're sort of working with region two and three because we're, New York is in region two, but the rest of the Bay states are in three. DEC is the New York State Agency that's working on this. They are our true representative at the table when it comes to the talks and the negotiations. So that's something I haven't mentioned yet. So 
yes, there's lots of partners, but there's also politics. And if you go back and look at those dates I showed you at the beginning, I'm sure you can see some, uh, uh, you can make, <laughs> you make some inferences for how political things were going at those times. Um, so the next, per the next group that I wanna talk about is the USC. It's the Upper Susquehanna Coalition. This is the partnership of all the soil and water districts that are within the Upper Susquehanna watershed. So both New York and Pennsylvania soil and water districts coming together to work on this issue. So we represent that whole upper area of the watershed. And there's paid staff that are part of that, um, that USC group that are um, not affiliated with any one soil and water district. They're working across the entire watershed. And there's people working on agriculture projects, stream projects, wetland, and buffers. Um, buffers that I'm referring to in this presentation are riparian forest buffers. So planting trees and shrubs along streams in that riparian zone. So, um, I just flash back to that map I showed you earlier. Um, and so everything that has blue on it, that's the watershed. Um, all of those counties get to be part of the USC. And because we've all banded together, we can get a hold of federal grants from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, we can get some of the other, um, like uh, when EPA puts out Chesapeake Bay money we can get it funneled to us and then we can get work done and get things on the ground that are actually going to help the bay. And so now the, la um, the last stakeholder that I'm gonna talk about in detail are the soil and water conservation districts. And to give you a little bit of background, I gave you some history of where soil and water districts came from and why they exist. So, um, the Dust Bowl was happening at the same time as the Great Depression. And while all of that's going on, Henry Ford came out with the gasoline powered tractor. And so there's all this tillage going on in the Midwest on top of all of these other um, issues. And it, it was devastating. And I'm sure you all know about the Dust Bowl, have seen those photos of like the landscape just being bare and all of that soil eroding away in the wind. Um, so in the 1920s, um, Hugh Bennett began to publish articles about soil erosion and he's kind of called the father of soil conservation. He was really involved in um, the soil erosion service I have listed there and the soil conservation service. Um, he was the director of those. So um, he had some really good ideas about what we should be doing to protect our soil and to make it healthier. And um, he was leading the charge in those federal organizations. And so after the federal government starts doing some work towards um, saving our soil and our natural resources in 1937, now there's a a law put in place for states to start having soil and water conservation districts. And um, once that happens, each state starts immediately like establishing some. And so across New York state, every county has a soil and water district. And every district that you go to is going to be a little bit different based on the needs of their county. So if you go to a county, you know, closer to New York City, they're going to be more focused on the urban and stormwater pollution types of things. Um, out here in Western New York, there's a lot of agriculture. And so that's, you know, going to be a primary focus for um, districts out here. And so it, it's pretty neat um, to see the um, scope of work that districts do. They work all the way across the board from ag to soils to wetlands and buffers like they're they're working the full gamut of natural resources um, and so the other thing i was going to mention here is originally the push for this came from the federal government and then they um, were sort of helping along the states get there the tables have turned now and it's a locally led um, effort to be protecting our natural resources. It's coming from the soil and water districts and we're assisting 
our federal partners. Um, they're not called the um, Soil Conservation Service anymore. It's called NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, and FSA, Farm Service Agency, that are doing those programs now. And I know across the board, people at the Soil and Water Districts are pushing this work. Um, and they're the federal government's just kind of assisting. So the main goal of all soil and water districts is to preserve those natural resources and improve water quality. Um, I pulled these from my district in Tioga, but if you talk to Allegheny County, I'm sure their, their stuff is really similar. So we spend the majority of our time on stream work and best management practices on farms. And we also try to do a lot of outreach and education um, with students um, in our county and having stream cleanup days and our tree and shrub sale, all of that kind of stuff. So um, heading into the main work of what soil and water districts do. So now I've, I've kind of made it, um, I'm gonna jump back to the TMBL in a few minutes with some uh, specific numbers, but I wanna get into a little bit of what soil and water districts are doing on the landscape. So we're doing cover crops, uh, which are planted on fields after corn gets harvested. That field would be really bare. You'd start losing sediment. You'd um, have a lot of runoff water. So when you see bright green fields in the fall, those are cover crops. Um, oh, you know what, actually, I have a bunch of photos at the end. I'm gonna jump ahead to the next slide. So um, implications of this TMDL, it's affecting everyone who lives in the Bay watershed. So all of us who live here in the watershed, it matters choices that we make every day about our water. Um, but also the EPA mandated this TMDL. So who's doing that work? I've already told you the answer. It's, it's me and all the other soil and water districts that are um, across the state and across the watershed. But who's putting these practices on the ground and who's providing that ground? Though um, those are like the main, main points that we tried to make in our um, WIP three. And so here's those numbers that I was talking about being lofty goals. So these numbers are in millions of pounds. And um, you can see that our uh, phosphorus we're meeting. We've actually exceeded and gone past where, where we needed to be. And that's in large part to um, the wastewater treatment um, numbers. So here is the sectors. So urban runoff is all those developed places. Um, wastewater is the point source. So those are our wastewater treatment plants. We had one that's in Broome County in Johnson City that was not operating um, the way that it should be. And so once that got where it needed to be, it it really helped us with our phosphorus. And so that's why we're meeting phosphorus now. Um, septic refers to like everybody's houses and your septic system, you know, all of that is still putting out nutrients. Um, there's still an impact from, from houses that have to be accounted for in here. And then forest is natural. So there's gonna be a natural amount of nitrogen and phosphorus out in the environment. And so that has to be accounted for in here as well. Um, but you'll see that I've bolded and highlighted agriculture. They get the finger pointed at them as being the biggest contributor of pollution. Um, they are a large contributor. They're, I would say that, you know, the finger gets pointed across the board. We all every day um, are making choices that could pollute or not pollute the planet. So, uh, but agriculture is the big buzzword. That's the big place that everybody's looking for reductions to be made. And so you can see that the goals were um, pretty lofty. So I have the target number there and then what current is. And so what we're trying to do is reduce to the target number so that the load of nitrogen and, and phosphorus and sediment um, getting to the bay is reduced. And um, okay. 
So my job in Tioga County is to work with all the farmers in my county to put these conservation practices on the ground. So when, I, when the WIP 3 was coming out in 2018, there was a lot of coverage on it and people started hearing about it. So I started doing some talks to chat with farmers about what this means for them. These are the frequently asked questions, like what does that really mean? It's some government document that you know I've read that I know about, but every landowner doesn't, isn't gonna read that or maybe know about it. Why should you care about it? How's it going to affect me is the big one from farmers because they see the finger being pointed at them and they want to know what does this mean? Um, and, you know, really, why are we taking this on um, from a USC and a soil and water perspective? Because DEC is the one on the line. They're the representative that has to um, answer to the EPA. It's not actually us in this case. They're the legal entity but we're, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do and improving local water quality right here in the district is the same or in the county is the same thing as improving it for the Bay, right? Because our local water is what's flowing on the surface down to the Bay and also recharging all of our aquifers and our drinking water sources. So it benefits us to be paying attention to our water quality. Um, so I have a couple of points here about what the whip, what it really comes down to, what it really means. Um, so there's a deadline 2025 and it's coming up, um, at the end of the day, what, how much progress is EPA looking for? Are there going to be consequences? Are there going to be regulations that come out of this in 2025? We don't know. I know we're not going to meet all of the goals that they've set out for us. So we are anxiously waiting to see what they say, but I also know that all of the goal numbers are going to change because they have not factored into their model that they use climate change. So they're going to, um, in the next couple of years, factor in climate change and change all these goals that we're supposed to be meeting by 2025. This is where like, politics uh, don't always like meet up with science in the way that it should because it kind of seems like we should have figured this out before now before the deadline but here we are uh, things take time and yeah so we're, we're waiting to see consequences um, my opinion thought is that they're probably just going to make a new deadline and come out with new goals that incorporate the climate change. And then we're just gonna have new things we have to work toward. I hope there are not regulations that come out, but that's a worry for farmers um, because they're the ones getting the finger pointed at. So are they gonna start regulating farm uh, manure spreading and stuff like that more? Those are things that they're worried about. Uh, positive is that because we have this problem we have to deal with, we have the story, we have the narrative to leverage grant funds to our watershed and to our soil and water districts to get work done. Um, and to my earlier point, looking at the future, we cannot afford to not have healthy soil. Um, these pictures, um, the bottom picture is some erosion that happened in our county um, after a large precipitation event. So if you guys are kind of paying attention to climate and weather patterns, we're getting, especially we've seen in Tioga County, we already have a very flashy stream system, meaning that the water runs off the landscape really quick and gets into the stream and makes flash flooding situations downstream. So we already have that type of landscape. And on top of that, we're now getting larger rain events in a shorter amount of time. So instead of getting a long day of rain, we're getting like this huge rain event all at one time in an hour. So those types of events are really starting to show up at, in our landscape. And we have situations like this where there's just complete erosion of crop fields. Um, and the top picture is a picture of those cover crops that I mentioned earlier. Um, 
farms need to be thinking about soil health. Um, I'll get into some of the reasons like why these things all line up in a little bit when I go um, through some pictures of projects we've done, but um, they need to cut their um, expenses too. And so it's nice that some of our practices line up for them. Uh, again, soil health, you're gonna get better yields on your crop fields if you have better soil health. So those go hand in hand. Um, and then I already mentioned the streams. So some of those challenges is also the farming economy because farms are less willing to do work with us because they're already struggling very, very much, especially dairy farms. Um, so that makes things a little bit difficult. Um, there's a huge funding gap. Um, I estimated that there's $121 million annually that we would need between um, now and 2025 to get all of that work done. With um, the impacts of COVID, that number is probably actually a lot higher because building materials have gone up. So we do lots of um, grazing projects where we're building fence. We could not get fence posts in 2020. A lot of our projects got delayed because we couldn't get them. So there's, there's lots of other supply chain issues that are impacting um, our work too. And then I mentioned staffing challenges. There's only so many people that work at a district and there's only so much you can do in a day. And the amount of work that we would have to do to actually meet those 2025 goals is physically impossible to do um, by 2025, which is why I say that they're very lofty goals. And um, it was a little bit wild to really suggest those as doable in that amount of time. So moving forward, um, we noted all these challenges, like I've mentioned in our web three, and they didn't love it, but they accepted it. Um, Pennsylvania is still getting a lot of scrutiny over their whip and they had to redo theirs and just submit it again um, because they're the farthest behind. Um, yeah, we're doing we're doing the best we can and we're not we're not giving up, even though we know we're not going to make it because, like I said, it still benefits our local water quality. So. Um, now I'll go through some of what that work looks like. So all of these numbers and reducing loads of nitrogen and phosphorus, these are the practices that do that on the landscape. So making cultural changes with farms. So we're working on nutrient management plans, which means the nutrients are the, in the manure. So we're literally managing how they're spreading their manure, when they're spreading it, putting setbacks away from streams so that the nutrients are going in the crop field and not just running right off into the stream um, nearby. Reducing tillage is going to increase your, or it, it's going to improve your soil health. So reducing how much you're tilling and flipping the, the soil over is going to, um, keep all of those soil microbes alive, which are really important to plant growth. Um, so if you think about a field that just gets plowed up um, every season before they plant corn into it, those microbes got destroyed, uh, they died off. The populations are still like on the outsides of the field, but now they gotta work their way back into the field on the living roots once they get planted. So you're, you're gonna get better yields on your fields that you've kept your soil biota intact on. And we have the research to prove this kind of stuff, but it still takes um, the one-on-one, -on -one, the person going to the farm, the person working for um, years with the farm, building that relationship and getting them to trust you and work through um, how you're going to put these things into your farm and I'm calling them cultural changes because um, farmers have a sense of um, like um, granddad did it this way and so I'm carrying on I'm doing the farm I'm, I'm doing it the way that he did it there's a heritage with it there's a pride of working the land um, and of their farms so it does take time and um, openness to get them to move forward with some of these practices. They can feel like 
it can feel really big and scary to them. And so it's our job, which is um, part of that locally led thing. I mean, it, there are people that live in your community that can come out and work with you on your farm. So here's one of our um, classic farmstead practices. Um, the before picture on the top is probably something that you can drive around anywhere and, and see something like that. You've got surface water um, ponding there. You've got the cows walking through it. It's a muddy mess. There's manure everywhere, manure and mixing with that clean rainwater uh, that ponds up there. And so we can build a covered barnyard, which you see in the lower picture. Um, that, that big old barn is still there for um, reference. So we kind of added on to the backside of it. This makes a covered feeding area, which allows the farmers to scrape up all that manure, save it for when they want to go spread it on their crop fields, which is good. We want the crops to use the nutrients because that's the nutrient cycle, right? The cows eat the, the corn, uh, they make manure, you take the manure back out and put it on your crop field. That's a healthy nutrient system. Um, and so that's what we want to see. Uh, so the little, this little Atashack section right here is the little stacking pad manure storage area. So they can scrape down this whole barn, the cow stay in there all winter. That's the biggest time that you're gonna get um, pollution and what we call heavy use area um, where cows are mucking it up and, and the manure is mixing with clean water. Um, we call rainwater clean water. So we wanna try to keep those things separate and keep clean water clean. Here is one, a, a large classic rectangular manure storage, and it's got the ramp on the side so that they can get down in there and access some of the solids. So when you start uh, working in this field, you start learning a lot about ag and all of the um, pieces that go into that. So farmers have to agitate their manure storages to uh, mix up those solids and, and liquids and get it kind of in that middle place where they can actually spread it on fields. Um, so I should mention, we have an engineering team on staff. So we have a professional engineer who does the design work for this. Um, so when you, you know, engineers is a, a normal job to go into, but um, when you start doing it on farms, you have to now think about how they're going to utilize this manure storage. It's not as simple as building walls that are going to stand up. You have to think about access points. Um, you have to think about daily use and daily scraping down the barns and getting in there. So these are all planning elements that go into our work. Um, okay, so here's a before photo, and when I click forward, you're going to see um, this is the same type of project, a covered barnyard, a heavy use area protection. Um, so we built this barn here that you see, and part of it is a manure storage again, and the other part is for the cows to stay in all winter. So when farms are working with us, uh, we try to get grant funds to assist them with the cost of this. These are obviously expensive projects. Um, and so rules come with that when you have grant money, now there's rules. So part of their operation and maintenance plan is if they are agreeing, they're gonna use it the way we want them to, which is keeping the cows in uh, for the winter. And then um, this slide has a little picture here, uh, a little arrow pointing to our buffer. So we also got a buffer out of this project. This is a different angle. And that red line is where we move the fence. So the old fence line was actually like in the stream. So the cows had access to the actual stream here. Um, and he also, um, when you work with dairy farms, uh, you find out that when they're milking cows, they have to wash down their parlor afterward. And we call that wash water for the parlor. It's um, technically dirty water um, because it's got milk and a little bit of manure and whatever else was on the floor of the parlor. So it's got a lot of nutrients in it. So we want to also get that on crop fields and not just let it discharge to streams, which is often the case on farms um, because they were built next to a stream because back in the day they needed water for the cows. Um, and then, oh great, let's just put the pipe over to the stream. 
it's easy and then the water goes away and isn't a problem. So we install like a catch basin, a tank to catch that. And then the farmers are able to mix it in with their manure and get it on the crop field. So in this case, it was discharging to the stream. So we fixed that issue, planted all of these little white things are tree tubes. So inside of that is a little tree or shrub. And so now we have our riparian buffer growing. I should have put in a more recent photo. So this was planted in May of 2019. And here we are just a few growing seasons later and some of the trees are big enough that we took the tubes off and it's actually starting to look like a forest, which is cool. Here is a rotational grazing system. Um, so we can do the math and work with the farmer to figure out how much grass they need to be feeding their livestock to make them grass fed animals. Um, some, some farmers, um, you know, are looking for that from their business standpoint. They want to have grass fed beef, grass fed whatever. Um, so we can help them figure out how much space they need to do that rotational grazing system. And the reason is because it improves soil health. We are spreading the nutrients out naturally on the ground because the cows are doing that for us, which is awesome. They're just uh, eating and doing their business out there and they're spreading those nutrients out on the landscape nicely for us evenly. Um, we are creating, um, when they trample some of that grass down, they're creating organic matter, um, which is good for the soil health. And then when you graze down to four inches, that's like the magic number in for grass. And then its recovery rate is at its highest there. So you start getting back lots of good grass regrowth and you haven't taken it past four inches where now um, you start killing off some of those um, soil microbes again, because um, the soil is not protected. So on a hot day, if there's no vegetation coverage, that soil is heating up, baking in the sun and it's killing off the microbes again. Um, so here's another grazing system that we did. Um, you can see we do a lot of mapping work. We use GIS um, all the time, every day to make all of our plan maps. So this is what her grazing system looks like. We install the watering system to make this doable. And then you see this green uh, shaded area is our stream corridor. So we got the whole corridor on her farm, which is awesome. Similar on, um, on this farm, we actually have the headwaters to a stream and we installed three wetland ponds, which are these little um, blue circles here. And here's a picture of one of them. So we created really good wildlife habitat. We protected the stream corridor um, and we converted this field to a pasture. It had been in row crop for like for forever, probably um, since someone decided to make that a field and it's been continuous corn for a very long time, which means that field is depleting all of its nitrogen all the time. And they're having to put in a lot of inputs onto the field. So that means more manure, more fertilizer. Um, onto a field to try to get corn to grow on it instead of using like a good crop rotation to naturally put some uh, nitrogen back into the soil. So it was good all around that they were able to buy this property and then add on to their grazing system with it. Here's a picture of those cover crops I was mentioning. So after corn comes off um, in the fall, they're pretty bare fields. We could lose a lot of sediment. Um, so from a water quality standpoint, we're looking to hold that sediment in place over the winter. Um, so planting something right after corn um, to just be there really for the winter um, takes care of that. And then it also keeps those soil microbes alive over the winter. And that allows over time for better crop yields on that field. And a lot of times, um, well, actually, and the, this um, cover crop is adding soil organic matter as well. So here's a photo in the spring. So the previous photo was from the fall, like a few weeks after um, planting, like maybe a month, month and a half. 
this is in the spring. You can see how green it got. Sorry, I clicked through a little. You can see how green it got. Um, so when you're driving around, you see a bright green field in the fall or spring when you think this is not growing season, you can know that that's a cover crop, which is awesome. So here's some more photos of um, some of our forest buffers. You can see like some of these trees are starting to pop up. These are probably the sycamores, which are usually the first ones to, um, they grow really fast and start popping out of their tubes. Uh, we try to engage the community in our tree plantings to A, make them aware about where our water goes to the Chesapeake Bay, the things that they can do to help with that. Um, and they get to actually like help plant trees, which is, you know, rewarding to do that um, kind of work. So this is at a local park in Owego, um, Hickory's Park, and we had a community event this past spring where we planted 300 trees along the stream there. More photos from it. Um, here is um, our largest buffer in Tioga County. It's 10 acres in size and it has um, close to 2000 stems in it. Um, so this is really big. And you'll see um, these shorter tubes are the shrub tubes and the taller ones are the tree tubes. There's oh, um, lots of plant people who figure out what we're gonna plant where, like what species are gonna do well in these um, landscapes, soil types, uh, how wet the site is. Um, and then there's lots of people doing research about how to grow trees because it's actually very difficult. We have um, unfortunately high mortality on some sites because it's just difficult to grow trees. Um, this is another angle of this um, big buffer. So this whole field, um, it's kind of hard to see, but this whole thing is planted. And here's Owego Creek, one of our largest creeks um, in Tioga County going right past it. So we planted like its entire floodplain right here, which is super awesome that we're putting that back to forest because that's what streams in our area are healthiest at um, is a forested habitat. Here's some stream work that we did. Um, so you can see the before the eroding bank and now we've got the stacked stone in there that's gonna hold that bank together. Um, Here's one of those flooding events um, that we've had. It, we're trying to work with it, deal with it, but that's why our um, projects are so important. Right where you kind of see this um, ripple, we have a stream project in here. We actually have a barb that comes across here and it's helping direct the flow of the water. So we have people that are engineering these barbs in the stream to funnel the water where we want it to go, which is against our, um, our stabilized bank over here. You can just see the rock because we're at a flood stage right now. But um, here's more photos of erosion that I've come across in our county. So you can see this is going right into this crop field. And every year they lose a little bit more. And this is how this stream normally looks, but during one of those high precipitation events, it's going across this field because it's flashy and it fills, that creek fills up with water and it just floods out of its banks all over this field. And here's my last slide. Um, we also do wetland restoration. So vernal pools inside the forest, uh, we make meadow areas and we put feature logs in. That's what these sticks are, right? These logs are right here for basking, for turtles. And um, they'll, they'll do whole trees over on their side. So all the roots are still in it too. And you'll see tons of tadpoles and salamanders and things using that, that habitat area. Um, and we're starting, other districts have been doing retention ponds in Tioga. We're just starting to do um, some really big retention pond projects, which is really exciting because that's really what you need to combat climate change. You need to grab all of that water that's rushing off the landscape and hold on to it for an extended amount of time, let it slowly infiltrate and let it slowly uh, discharge from that pond. So we're really excited to 
start doing that type of work because we really need it in our county. And that is what I have for you today. Are you asking about like manure spreading right next to streams? Okay. So it's not illegal to spread manure on a field by a stream. Um, if you see a discharge of like manure, it's like, like they left a giant pile of it and it's washing right into the stream. Um, that is a violation, but soil and water districts are not regulatory. So we aren't the people to go to. That's DEC. They are the regulatory people and they have a um, water quality like response phone, phone line and you can remain anonymous when you call it and their people will check into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so my my field work, I probably spend about 50% of my time out in the field and I'm working with um, large farms, which we call CAFOs. So CAFO stands for confined animal feeding operation. Those are the large farms that have over 300 animal units on them. So that's any type of livestock over 300 animal units and animal units is a thousand pounds. So you have to like, you know, convert the weights of the animal. So like you need a lot more chickens than cows to get there. Um, but if you're over the CAFO line, you are regulated by DEC. You have to have a comprehensive nutrient management plan. You get inspected on a, um, they go every two years so biannual basis, uh, they get inspected by DEC and we get to attend those. So I do still work with our CAFOs a little bit. We only have a couple in Tioga, um, but for the most part, they don't need me because they've hired a private um, planner to write that plan for them and they are fully implemented. So to be a CAFO, you have to have taken care of all of your environmental issues and you have to be on a regular basis updating your spreading manure spreading plan all of that nutrient management that goes on across the farm that has to be done all the time but i'm also working with the really small farms so some of the um, grazing systems i showed you are for those like 40 cow beef farms are for the like um they have like 30 goats and 20 sheep and they're kind of a homesteading type of thing. Um, and they have a bunch of pigs and they're doing pork. So I'm working with all sizes of farms across the board and their needs are all a little bit different. So dairy farms, you spend a lot more time with because they have a lot more things that could be resource concerns that you're working with them on. Um, a lot of times with the grazing systems, it's like we develop the plan, we put in the fence and watering system, and we just check on them every few years to make sure things are going well. Does that answer it? Yeah. yeah with the, uh, just the ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no-till is awesome. It just takes time for people who have been convinced, like tilling and doing all those conventional practices. It takes time to adjust your mindset for it. And also your fields are not ready to just immediately go to no-till because they probably have compaction layers where you've been tilling all this time. So it just takes time, but it's, you, I'm seeing it more and more, which is really awesome that people are starting to see the benefits of no-till. Yeah. Any 
Absolutely. And across New York state, there have been lots of positions open. So I would definitely look when you get to that point. Um, so like I said, there's one in every county and all the county's needs are different. So you're going to have different specialized people. So like we have people that specialize in forestry, people that are specializing in the streams and hydrology, um, even um, so like my background's in geology and I've learned all of these farm things on the job, but it's a job where you, you, you're always learning. There's always new things to see. So they send you to lots of trainings and things. Um, so you can catch up even if you don't, you, you're interested, but you don't necessarily know a lot about farming. You can easily catch up and figure it out. And it's a very rewarding job, especially when you spend all day planting trees. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So it's both, um, but there's other players when it comes to septic. So I didn't get into that um, when I was going through all of those sectors. Soil and water districts are really hitting on the agriculture piece of that puzzle. Um, DEC works with all of the wastewater treatment plants and some soil and water districts do put on like septi septic system, um, like informational sessions for landowners to learn more about what's going on. Um, but they're more of the entity that's working with like the towns and um, villages on their systems. Um, there's also MS4 communities out there, um, which is a designation for certain um, size communities, and they do have things they have to follow and work with DEC on, just like the CAFOs. Let's thank Danielle one more time for coming. <laughs>